This episode of More Than That is brought to you by General Motors. You can learn more about General Motors' commitment to fostering diversity, equity, and inclusion at GM.com. Technology is everywhere. It's changing the vision of what it means to be a technologist that I think is really, really critical. Innovation is essential to growth in a community because simply a community is always changing. When we lose sight of what it is to be human with each other, which is the interaction, the laughter, the moment sharing, it's definitely connected, you know? So if we lose that option to really be personable with each other, we're lost. We are not included in the in the advances unless we are the ones creating it. The power to literally help define relationships, that's what designers do. That's, that's a big deal. Do you feel included in America? Do you feel included in the now? Design is life. From how our cities are planned, streets decided upon, to where grocery stores and housing are located, design impacts every part of life. And you better believe that race plays a key factor in all of it. If it doesn't always feel like the world around you is made with you in mind, chances are it probably wasn't. It matters who's in the room, y'all. And Sherelle Dorsey, Winona Satcher, and Lisa Galopter are in these rooms. They spoke with me to discuss and break down innovation, technology, design, and how we got next in all of these areas in this episode of More Than That. I'm so excited to talk to my social media turned real life friend, Sherelle Dorsey. She's most known as the founder and CEO of The Plug, a tech news and insights platform covering black innovators in tech, venture capital, the future of work policy, and more. There's so much that you've been able to accomplish, but how did you enter the tech field? I will say it starts with right place, right time. I grew up in Seattle, Washington in the 90s when the internet was just starting to become a thing. And uh, my grandfather bought all of these computers for me and my cousins to like be on the internet. Now, granted, I do not come from a technical family. So my mother was like, look, this black woman has converted this storefront like in the hood, retired Microsoft millionaire, Trish Malines DeZico, who said, I've been the only person in my space you know, on this campus. And I want to teach kids of color how to code. So I got to go there twice a week, every week through school and learn computer programming, um, learn how to set up servers. And, you know, then you become the resident like geek squad for your whole family. Um, But more important, Gia, was that I got to work at Microsoft as an intern from the time I was 14 years old. So I had this unique advantage and I was paid, which meant that I got to save money also for college. When I look back on it, it's like, wow, like none of my friends got those kinds of opportunities. Wow, that is so awesome. I love that that woman, the change agent really was able to turn a storefront into a place where she would mold the careers of so many black and brown children. I think that is so awesome. And that is the literal key, right? Like that is the key to all of it. But how would you describe the current relationship between the Black community and tech and then how you would like to see it change? I will say that it's like the Black community in every other industry and every other challenge, right? We're always battling for space. We're always battling for acknowledgement. When the business media was only talking about, you know, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, and Elon Musk, it was like, well, You know, the people who taught me how to code and taught me about technology and gave me scholarships, those were Black people, those were Black engineers. So this idea that we weren't innovating in the space meant that somebody wasn't telling our stories. That really is the premise and the foundation that I report from as a journalist. And just time and time again, you know, not seeing so many of us represented, I think a lot of it is, we just have to say, let's go take up space. Yeah, I love that. And I love how you broke down innovation to that level and like how our communities have always been innovative. We've had to be, Gia. We haven't been served in the same manner. Hmm. We just haven't always had the capital to then create full scale companies. And we all know that the process of raising capital is complicated, um, but clearly not impossible because white people do it all the time. So can you describe the process of raising capital and how black innovators can raise equity free capital as someone who has done it yourself? Absolutely. Um, The process is different for everyone. My process has been very unconventional because I right out of the gate decided to focus on revenue. 
Um, mm. I think I was a bit scarred and jaded from the horror stories about Black folks, especially Black women raising capital. And so I thought, go to where folks love you and stay away from places that they don't. And I knew that the journalism industry has just taken a major hit, right? The business model has yeah. changed drastically. And so I knew that there was a thirst for um, quality over quantity. I was going after dollars first, but knew the journalism industry and the foundations that were starting to support it would be a great resource and reference for grants. So I started off on that route and eventually decided to do some raising um, based on the fact that I just, I had to build capacity, right? Because yeah. what the capital allows you to do is to grow. But the reality is like, you, you're giving up equity, which means you own less and less of your company. VCs are breathing down your neck because they want to get their money back. So you got to be careful. But I also needed it, Gia, because the black wealth gap means that I can't go raise a friends and family round. You know, my family could give me a round of applause <laughs> for starting my yeah. company. <laughs> they give you a round of applause and maybe, you know, you get a good meal when you get home. But I couldn't raise a hundred thousand dollars for my family. Mm -hmm. They didn't have that kind of money to spare. So yeah. whereas other folks from other communities may have that startup capital, access to capital is one of those barriers that keep us small. So when we talk about the job gap challenge, the reason why that capital matters is because we are usually much more adept at hiring folks from underrepresented backgrounds. And that's going to be better overall for communities of color. Um, but the process for raising is different for everyone based on values, based on strategy. Um, it looks sexy, but you got to know it's, it's a sharp game. It really is. Yeah. I took on capital in August and I had to really shift my perspective about what is my purpose? Am I just going mm -hmm. to tell Black folk story about tech or am I going to change the way the industry views innovation from the lens of other people that come from other kinds of environments and backgrounds and perspectives. What I learned is like, I have nothing to lose. You discover more about society and the world, um, but more important, you also know that you can continue to reinvent yourself. Mm. My grandfather is from Birmingham, Alabama and left when he was a teenager. And I think about the nature of all of the opportunities he had, but then so much of the opportunities he never had access to. And I think about how very different our lives are. You know, there was a point like a couple of years ago when I started my entrepreneurship journey, my grandparents thought like, why don't you just get a real job? Like you over here, yeah. you know? <laughs> You know, the they, real think, job. Where you gonna go to? You need to. And I'm like, right. it's never gonna happen. We right, we're right. Just get it over with. But that generation knows work. They know getting to the next level, especially being Black in America and the struggles and the challenges. And so I think about like, wow, like if I didn't have that foundation, would I have had the courage to then go and feel like, yeah, I can go build something. Mm, that's beautiful. Thank you for breaking that down so beautifully. And I'm so proud of the ways that you're taking up space for us to take up more space. We're gonna pause here to take a quick word from our sponsors. See, the thing about all of this is the way we see our place in the world and the way we see ourselves is our own power. This drive is rooted in what's good for us, how we move through and tell our own stories. But it's more than that. General Motors proudly supports building positive change together. General Motors aspires to be the world's most inclusive company and is committed to helping create a clean, safe, and equitable world for all. Learn more at GM.com. Winona Satcher is the CEO and founder of Make Her Studio LLC, a for-profit green manufacturing firm and design build studio, making communities that work for brown and black folks and on our own terms. Thank you so much for being a part of this conversation because I'm very new to what actually happens behind the scenes of creating these spaces for our communities to thrive. What made you say, okay, I need to take up space in this exact arena? <laughs> well, one, just being a woman of color, uh, growing up in Atlanta, Georgia, as well as other cities, similar issues. But, you know, conversations around why are our communities the way they are, right? And living in communities where there has been gentrification, but wanting to grow up and, and essentially gentrify my own in my own way. But I said another defining situation for me was when I was in design school. 
met a young girl in Mississippi. This young girl, young Black teenager working in fast food restaurants, she told me that she had never heard of the civil rights movement. No. Yeah. Can you believe that? <laughs> that And that was around about 2003. No. Yeah. Completely unacceptable, Gia. Uh, and that broke my heart to hear this from this young girl, that she didn't know her history. She was kept away from her history. She didn't have a safe space to understand her history and to grow into her own purpose. It signified to me that maybe my purpose is to use design to create these safe spaces. And I remember telling my grandmother, who was uh, heavily involved in civil rights, one of the things that she said was that you always build and march for those yet unseen. So those that you might not even know. Absolutely. There is so much that has happened to us, against us, when it comes to creating safe spaces to grow as human beings, to own homes, to even just feel comfortable moving around in. And so what do we need to understand as a people when it comes to design and equity? What don't we know that we really should know about those two terms? That's a really great question. And I would say first uh, that the, how we live in these communities today is on purpose. These are not natural occurrences. I think the understanding of why we live the way we live is critical to moving forward. And also putting our monies together in a way where we not only just acquire property, because it all comes down to land ownership, but also understanding how to develop that land for future generations. This is a generational wealth conversation. Uh, and so purchasing land is important, but also understanding the value of rezoning and land use so that we, what I call, we stitch the urban fabric. We tear down hmm. those systems that do work for some, but not for us, and create new communities that are focused on inclusion, on equity, meaning that we all have a space at the table because we do have a voice. We are not voiceless. And to me, that means building new tables, not necessarily sitting at existing ones. All of this is community development. All of this is understanding how all the pieces fit together. And not just looking at it as a systems approach, but an ecosystems approach. And that's what we do in our company. We work at the intersection of landscape architecture, of urban design, of policy, and how to finance the change that you want to see because you do need money to make a difference. Wow. Mm -hmm. that is, And that makes me think of Nipsey Hussle. Um, and may he rest in peace. But just thinking of how he was trying to buy back the block that's and right. essentially start a clubhouse area where kids could come in, everyone can learn all of the things they wanted to learn. He had basketball courts that were being created again. So how important are those type of public figures creating these narratives around buying back the block important to the work that you do as well? Oh, it's very, very, very critical. Mm -hmm. Because what you see outside of your door is what you probably might become. And our futures are determined by our zip code. And that's unacceptable. We have to start seeing our communities as opportunities to say, OK, this is how we want to grow. This is the kind of return of investment that we want. And we're going to determine how future generations see our communities. I mean, there's a white supremacist who's been buying up property in urban Atlanta for years. Imagine his perspective on how things should be rezoned on how uh, communities should be led, who are the advocates of these communities. I mean, I grew up in the Washington, D.C. area, and the Washington Post did a, a, an entire story about how D.C. is the most gentrified place yes. in the country. Like, And mm -hmm. I was just like, I feel it every time I go home. Like, mm -hmm. I feel the mm -hmm. erasure. Like, it, it, it is scary and it is sad. Mm -hmm. But how do we stop it like what is the the first step to even like having these approaches within our communities to buy back the block because it almost seems like it's too late yeah i mean it's deep right and it's, it's very multi-dimensional and i think that if we build off the current system then it is too late but if we create new systems and new approaches and innovate around how we finance these deals then it's not now it's time to restitch and create a new system to make it better Lisa Golopter is a computer scientist, entrepreneur, and technology executive. She is a groundbreaking media and digital boss, but oftentimes she's the only black woman in these rooms. So I know she can truly set the stage on what digital inclusion is really all about. Thank you so much. I had no idea the person who created the technology for the GIF was a black woman. So I am just so happy that you are here. This is so awesome. I appreciate that, but I would like to correct the record. There is a rumor going around on the internet that I invented the GIF. I did not. I, like, I've done some cool stuff. And so for me, there's a little bit of like, I want credit for the stuff I did do. <laughs> well, honestly, let's start there. 
what are some of the things that you have done and have contributed to? So I'll start with, right, I'm a black woman with a degree in computer science, which sadly makes me somewhat of a unicorn and makes me cry pretty much every day. And Mm. also, um, like, I come from a low-income background. Yes, I have a degree in computer science, but it took me 24 years to get it. But I've been fortunate enough to work on some pretty transformative technologies, right? I was a software engineer on Shockwave. I helped launch Hulu. I ran digital at BET, the television network. And then I went to work for President Obama at the White House, where I served as the chief digital service officer for the U.S. Department of Education. Which is incredible in itself. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, no, that was a whole journey. But I will say that it was really there that I came to understand that we really could harness technology to solve what had been previously thought of as intractable problems. So I'm actually also the CEO and founder of a company called Techwitable, where we're using technology to make workplaces more equitable. Can you break down some tangible ways that digital inclusion uh, helps shape and form the Black community and what what it is that we want to accomplish. And this is what we're doing with Techwitable, right? It's really about creating safe, inclusive, and equitable workplaces. And so a lot of folks, when they think about diversity and bringing Black and brown folks in, they're thinking about the pipeline. They're thinking about how do we bring people in the door? But one of the things that we talk about is how we are hired for diversity, but then managed for assimilation. And so how do you mm. actually retain folks? The rate at which uh, Black and brown folks leave is like three and a half times the rate of white men, where they're leaving tech. So how do you actually create an environment where black and brown folks are feeling comfortable and included in a sense of belonging and the culture of these workplaces actually invites them in? And to me, that seems like the most critical thing. And that's the the area where I have hope in terms of actually making some of those changes because corporations are now recognizing how important that is uh, and are starting to commit to making those changes. Right. Can you define digital inclusion? I guess I would define digital inclusion to be having black and brown folks have a seat at the table in terms of defining the future of where we're going to go, defining and creating the products, building on the products that exist, making use of them, harnessing them for the things that matter to us in our communities and building up community through technology and through digital platforms. I think that's how I would think about it. Why should that matter to us um, as Black people? Why should it matter? Why should we care about digital inclusion? Because if we're not some of the ones helping to define the future, the future will, one, leave us behind, but also, frankly, define us. Police systems are currently building AI into their recognition systems. There's a whole study about how AI systems that actually recognize humans do a fantastic job with white men, but the failure rate for black women is something like 31% like just extraordinarily bad. There's also artificial intelligence being used in the justice system now, making decisions around uh, risk of recidivism. And again, those are based on biased data, biased systems, right? Like it can have a real impact, frankly, on our freedoms. So Mm -hmm. that's one of the reasons why it's so important. Um, But again, Mm -hmm. this goes back to for me, which is like the digital economy is being made on the backs of black folks. And until we start to have seats at the table to start being financed to make the innovations ourselves, the wealth gap will just continue to grow. And that needs to close in a billion ways. I have one question for you about the performativeness that we've seen since the racial reckoning. What would you recommend we do in this moment to ensure that even if it is a trend, we create some tables that can't be taken away? I think that there is a level of ongoing accountability that I would love to see. So they're putting their money where their mouths are. And once they start putting budget to it, you know, putting up a black square on Instagram uh, is one thing. But what follows that? How do you actually live your values? How do you actually bring those cultural norms to bear at your organization? How are you investing in it? How do you make 15% of your suppliers be from the black community? It's not about pledges. It's about action. Ally is a verb, right? It takes proactive, committed, and concerted action. All right, y'all, I'll come clean. I never thought of myself in the design and technology spaces. But after these conversations, I really understood why these spaces desperately need more people like us. Thank you to Sherelle, Winona, and Lisa for the work you do and for sharing your insights into the innovation happening around us, by us, and for us. 
This episode of More Than That was brought to you by General Motors. Visit GM.com for more on their commitment to becoming the most inclusive company in the world. Don't forget to hit subscribe, give us a good rating, and follow us at More Than That Show on all platforms.